I'd really like to introduce uh, the next speaker to you, a very special person with a long history in communications, technology, cloud communications, has worked for large companies and with large companies, has worked with small companies and startups, has worked as an investor and an advisor to many interesting companies, and he has a very special perspective, I think, on humanness in this technology world. So I'd like to give the floor uh, with a warm, wel warm welcome to Mark Kesselman. So, um, so Rob, thanks. Thanks for the nice introduction. And I'm really glad to be back, actually. I was here last year and, and gave a slightly different talk. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit um, and share with you, as Rob mentioned, <clears throat> maybe a more behavioralist human perspective on AI as well as uh, consciousness and context. And um, hopefully you'll find it interesting. Uh, some of you may think it's just complete crap, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll see what happens, okay? Um, it will be a challenge to you. So we'll, maybe we'll have a, a shouting session at the end of it where we can like really get to it. So first of all, I'm a partner of Mistletoe. Mistletoe is a global impact investment fund that was founded by Taizo, Taizo's son. And um, Taizo's brother is Masayoshi's son who owns SoftBank. And so I work for Taizo, go around the world and look for really interesting entrepreneurs, um, interesting companies, people that are solving problems that can have a culture impact. And that means it could be, um, it could be something in the immediate term or it could be 10 or 20 or 30 years down the road. So we don't necessarily invest on market size, um, internal rate of return. If it's got an impact, then we're interested in that. And an example of one of these is uh, very recently a company called Zipline. I don't know if you've heard of it. They're delivering blood and medicine in Africa using drones. So they're flying around, dropping blood, dropping medicine. In Rwanda, it's a tiny country, but it takes about four hours to get across. It's only about 120 kilometers across. So if you get in a car wreck, or if you have a baby, chances of you dying are pretty high. So the drones launch, they fly around, and they drop, they drop blood and they drop medicine. And now, when somebody gets sick or gets in an accident or something, the family members actually run outside and look for the drones. It's pretty amazing. So that company is now worth over a billion dollars. They're expanding to Ghana, and they just got an FCC license in North Carolina, in the US, to, deliver, to make deliveries during disasters. So that's the kind of stuff that we're investing in. A lot of direct investments and also a lot of funds. Um, right now, four companies in the, in the group that are worth over a billion dollars, so you can, you can run the, the metrics on that. Um, it's pretty small in terms of those that rise up, but it's a big base of impact. <clears throat> So last year, um, when we came, we talked really about three things, which were side effect, meaning the, the secondary effect, over the main effect, meaning the thing that you think you're going to get. So look for that secondary thing. In the case of Zipline, the secondary effect was that the, company, the country of Rwanda did not have to buy a billion dollars worth of refrigerators to put all over the country to house blood, which expires. And in a country with a fairly difficult power environment, the refrigerators wouldn't do any good anyway. So that was a secondary effect, pretty powerful. So the other is inventing the future instead of waiting for it, which is a fairly common thing, but really pushing yourself out there. And the third is understanding over information. You can have a lot of information, but if you don't have any understanding, then what's the point, really? You're not, you're not really becoming clear. So we're gonna pivot a little bit. <clears throat> And I want to describe to you the, uh, a few things before we get into the main topic, which is the single consciousness AI concept. But first, I want to talk about human perception because it pervades the entire discussion. And I, I'm standing back so I can see the, the screen here. So does anybody know why they have mirrors in elevators? Well, so, so it turns out when elevators were first created, they were quite slow. I mean, first you had the problem of people didn't want to get in them, but they solved that problem. And then people are waiting around, you know, pushing the button. Ugh, this elevator takes forever. But a new elevator, you know, the new fancy ones that are fast, really expensive. And they shave just a few seconds of time. 
So it turns out if you put a mirror in front of an elevator button, guess what people do? They look at themselves. They love themselves. And time evaporates. When people look at themselves in the mirror, they actually lose track of time. It's like this weird form of time travel. And not just that guy, but her, and these guys, this girl looking through a, a, a window, looks like outside, and then of course the bro. You gotta have the bro shot in there. Even the bro is taking a picture of himself, okay? So everybody falls to this kind of reality. We love to look at ourselves and suddenly time evaporates and a mirror is 10 cents and a new elevator is 10 million. What, what are you gonna do? Mirrors everywhere, <laughs> mirrors everywhere. We love ourselves. Oh, and by the way, I don't know if you know this in the US, the door close button in the elevator doesn't work. It's fake. It's just there to make people, to once again, distract them. They walk over, takes about two seconds and you come back and you push the button and it was gonna close anyway. So this notion of human perception and everything that we do is really fascinating. So it isn't, it isn't good enough to just do what we do. We really have to understand how is it being absorbed on the other side, okay? And if you're in the product side of the, the shop, it's super important, but even on the engineering side, we say, okay, you know, look, you know, the data went here and here and here and here, you must buy it, isn't that the, you know, like, that's it, right? And it doesn't always work like that. <clears throat> So, single consciousness AI is not about machine learning and models and, and uh, reinforcement learning and uh, you know, big data sets. This is actually, what I'm gonna talk about is a little bit, uh, for the data scientists in the room might be disappointing because I'm not gonna get into a new model theory and all this stuff. It's gonna be very kind of human behaviorist sort of approach. But if you think about the technology serving the human need, it might be kind of instructive, okay. So first question is, of course, we have to ask the question, what is consciousness? And context is super important to consciousness, but if you think about consciousness as coordinated awareness. Now, coordinated awareness isn't just a human construct, right? I mean, coordinated awareness, uh, lots of organisms have coordinated awareness. This photo I thought was fascinating because uh, there's not a bridge there. And so these, these little beings are working together to get across something. It's pretty fascinating. So there's some kind of coordinated consciousness across multiple organisms here working together to accomplish something together, which implies by definition some form of consciousness. Now, is it individual consciousness or is it collective consciousness? This is a really good question, but clearly some kind of consciousness. <clears throat> so, um, we're gonna take a look at basically three stages of consciousness and how this pertains to AI also as we get into what the human perceives on the other side of the tech. So if you think of really three things, connectedness, so we're literally, you know, we're, we're literally connected to one another, and that could be verbal connection, it could be physical connection, it could be some, there, some kind of connection between the parties, multiple parties, that is, uh, or even in your own brain. So you can have, a, you can have sort of an internal dialogue of, of connectedness. Contextual awareness, uh, an understanding of the place that you're in. Like the little ants kind of understood they were, I wanted to go from here to here. That's a very interesting understanding that they had. They wanted to go to those two different places and they had to do it together. One ant could not cross that, that little, probably it was probably like a two inch gap. And then this idea of non-temporal awareness. I don't know if anybody knows what non-temporal awareness is, but is as a human, if you think about the past and you think about the present, you can actually do that at the same time. And so you're thinking in two, timelines at the exact same time. So you're thinking about two topics across time in different times that may not even happen right now. So I can think about two or more times in the past that have nothing to do with right now. It's a bizarre way of kind of understanding what consciousness is. So non-temporal awareness is super important. 
So connectedness, as we know, is sort of this ability to be around other people. So you don't even have to be related to somebody, but if you're just near them, you're kind of connected. And you can, have you ever, have you ever had that sense where you're standing there, <clears throat> maybe in the subway or something, and you just kind of feel like someone, someone behind you? And, you know, we don't have, they might even actually be like pickpocketing you or something <laughs> like that. Um, no one would pickpocket here in, in Amsterdam, though. It doesn't, there's no crime, right? No? I don't know. So, uh, super important to be connected to other people. Contextual awareness would be if you take that connectedness of where we're just around one another and then actually sort of look at each other. So if we look at each other, we establish this context and we start to, as a human, have this expectation of consciousness on the part of the other person. <clears throat> and then the third thing is this idea of non-temporal awareness, which is as an observer, you can look back at the past, and you can think about now. So when we put all those things together as a human, if I see those three things in combination in any other abstract or non-abstract artifact, I will actually assume consciousness on the part of that other entity. Now this is a very interesting human reality where we tend to you know, look for our own existence in the other things that we see. And so this is super important for AI. Very, very important for AI. <clears throat> um, but it's also important to note that all of that occurs without human participation. So the human just walks in and says, I'm a human and I will try to turn everything into human understanding. So they go and they look and they say, okay, well, that's like me and that's like me and that looks like me, that doesn't look like me. Everything's about me, 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 all this stuff, right? But all of this stuff actually already exists in some other way, but we apply our humanity to it. Now, this tree right here is 1,800 years old, <clears throat> super old tree. And it turns out trees have non-temporal awareness. Trees know where water used to be. Really old trees know where water used to be. And it's kind of strange. Like, how does a tree know where water used to be? And it turns out that trees embed in other parts of their structure a representation of where they used to go to get water. And when they don't have water, they remember this construct that they actually built somewhere in the other part of the tree, which causes the tree to grow in a certain direction. And it finds water. It's magic. So the tree is literally storing something from the past and then reaccessing it somehow. And it's, uh, it's very difficult to, to understand this. In fact, uh, my family has a, a, a little ranch west of Austin, Texas. If you've ever been to Austin, you know, it's kind of full of ranches and everything. And we ha have a tree like this. And it's right next to a creek and it's giant. It's been there for like 2,000 years. It's incredible. And it's got its own kind of memory. When you see it, like whether you see a place like this, or you see the tree, or you see the artifacts that exist, you can kind of read into some kind of history in that. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> okay. So um, we're gonna sh shift into a little bit of human discussion and get into some tech as well. So four really fascinating things about human beings. Uh, one, we mark time, and we are excellent scorekeepers. Right? I mean, I have four kids, and they are scorekeeping constantly. He got this, she got this, she got this, she got this. Like, it's like they're all going to be accountants when you grow up, you know, because they're measuring everything. Like, you had two M&Ms, and I had four M&Ms, and that's a blue one, and I had two green ones, and two green equals five reds. I mean, it's, you're like, what? And they're just measuring stuff constantly. We also look for familiarity and patterns because it's sort of a rationalization for who we are, right? So if something else is like me, then I'm prob maybe I'm okay. Maybe I'm not so strange and different. Um, and then the other thing too is we constantly try to figure out everything. I mean, all we have to do is say, can you imagine a blue elephant? And everyone in the room probably just thought of a blue elephant. Because you're constantly trying to figure out, oh my God, a blue elephant, what is that? Oh, blue, okay, Psh, got it, it's gone. Now I'm thinking about the thing that I was just thinking about before. And so we're highly subject to this type of like, thought process manipulation. <clears throat> All right, so here I am at API Days. I'm a participant, and I had the API Days in 2018. I've got this current API Days, and then there's gonna be a future, well, Apiology, 
So maybe it's not API days, maybe it is API days. But I also have this expectation of something in the future. So all of us right now are not only thinking about what happened, but what is happening and what is about to happen. And we're doing it about similar topics. So all of us are now in this kind of function, okay? So we're also thinking, what time is lunch? What time is dinner? When do I check out? How much money do I have? When's my rent due? When's my mortgage due? You know, all of these other things, right? So we're constantly measuring, oh, and guess what else we're doing? We're estimating. I think I'll have a certain amount by the time I leave here. If I get to the taxi and I take it this far, then I can get out and walk. And, you know, we're doing all of these calculations constantly. And it's just consuming all of our brain. So whenever we see something similar in its behavior, we assume that it has consciousness, because that's what we do. So let's look at this picture for a second. Um, now this might actually look like a strange looking guy or a girl, depending upon your level of focus. If you squint or if you're drunk, this looks like a woman actually. But if you're sober and your eyes are open, it probably looks like a guy. Who sees a guy? Who sees a woman? Wow, there's a lot of drunk people here. <laughs> okay, you know what's fascinating about this is that the pixels on this screen actually neither contain the full face of the guy or the woman. And your brain is inserting all of the rest of the detail to tell you what it is. And the other fascinating thing about this, well, before I do that, let me show you this one. <laughs> You've seen this one? Some of you might have seen this. It's either, who sees Einstein? And then Marilyn Monroe? Drunk people. Drunk. You're double drunk right there. Um, so um, the, here again, the pixels on this page do not contain either the complete image of Einstein or the complete image of Marilyn Monroe, but your brain is actually filling in the gaps, which means you are actually seeing something that isn't there which is kind of scary, okay? Um, it turns out that this, this um, test doesn't work on kids. Because if a kid has never seen a picture of Albert Einstein, it will not insert the data associated with Albert Einstein. It will just see blurry. Now, what does that tell you about kids? Like, second order effect. What it tells you is that kids only see the world as it is, not as their brain inserts data into it, which is completely fascinating. So basically we become, we spend our, we spend our lives living real and then we spend the rest of our lives having our brain tell us what real might be. And we're living in a fantasy land after we grow up. Um, so here again, we're inserting data into, the, into an image and having our brain tell us what's actually there. So now let's talk about this concept of the appearance of consciousness. Because if you're an AI and you're building a machine and or a robot and you, know, you wanna have uh, love and affection with your robot or you want the robot to like destroy humanity, these apparently are the only two options for robots, by the way, in the entire world. You're either gonna, going to marry a robot or the robot will annihilate you. I mean, that's it. There's, there's no middle ground whatsoever. Like, nothing else is possible. But it turns out that you don't have to create the perfect romance robot or the perfect killer robot. You only have to create the appearance of the romance robot because the human, as we know, is so easily duped by data that isn't even there that you can create the appearance of it and they will think that it is real. So we have some great examples of this actually. Um, who saw the duplex demo? Right? The duplex demo, which as we know now, 40% of it is actually live operator, but we won't talk about that. Any Google guys in the room? Sorry if there are Google guys in the room. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, great, you know, they'll get there. Hair salon, you know, you saw this, you saw this whole thing, how can I help you? Duplex, hi, I'm calling, you know, it's a natural voice. I need to get an appointment, something from May 3rd, and the salon says, sure, give me a second. And duplex says, mm-hmm, now come on. What robot is gonna go, mm-hmm, the robot says, mm-hmm, because it creates the appearance 
of thought and empathy and response and all these things which are completely unnecessary in a robotic sense, if you think about it, right? But it's intentional in the designer eye because what are we trying to do? We're trying to convince the human on the other end of that line that they are talking to another human. And one way to do that is to throw in all of these unnecessary things that humans do that are actually quite empathetic, like, mm, mm, oh, mm, oh, yeah, mm, 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 yeah, mm, yeah. Now, if you really want to get tricky with that, you do what American Airlines does is say, hold on, I'm checking on that. And she's really, yeah, she's checking on that, but what she wants you to do is waste your time while you think that you're having a conversation and it buys her 300 milliseconds to go look up data, okay? So there's all these sort of little uh, devices that you can use. So <clears throat> another one is distraction as a form of time travel. <laughs> you familiar with this concept? All right, here we go. Let's see if it works. Ah, uh, and we all just go, oh, something magical is happening. <gasps> what's actually happening during that distraction? Like, we look at that thing, and what's happening in the background? Amazon, Bezos is just buying time, because he knows we're like, wow, pretty lights. Oh, and when they go orange, then it's bad, you know, and then you unplug it and plug it back in, and it turns all these different colors. It's beautiful, right? And we're just wasting our time looking at it while Amazon goes out and gets data and brings it back to us to make it think that it's conscious, it's awesome. It's like when you turn to your kids and say, hey, do you have your socks? And they say, hold on a minute, and they run. Like, I'm getting it, I'm getting it. And they come running back with socks. They never had them in the first place. They were just waiting until you told them to go get socks. That's it's exactly what's happening here. It's complete distraction, but it gives us the appearance that something magical is happening. When in fact, it's, it's actually not quite that magical, it's kind of trickery. So, let's take a little bit deeper dive into Alexa because there's some really interesting things going on there. As frustrating as, as we get with Alexa, there's something really important that's happening that we need to pay attention to. So, three scenarios where I say the exact same thing to Alexa. Play some music. Now, the first time I meet Alexa, like the first time I meet Rob, hey, what's your name? Oh, I'm Rob. Oh, how are you doing? You know, and we get to know one another. Oh, okay. And then we go away. So she says, top 50 most played. I don't know you, Mark. So then we come back and I say, hi, Rob. So like a human, so now we know one another. Hi, Rob. Hey, you know, how was your morning? Oh, that's cool. You know, and we, we catch up. So this non-temporal awareness shows up. Boom, we catch up, current moment in time. We have an exchange, and we back off again. That's the second scenario. Here's a song you might like, because I, I had a past, right? So the relationship-minded contextual experience starts to occur. I have a new context. So it's generic, we're connected. Then it becomes context. Oh, I, Mark is in the room. And then the third is, I walk up and I'm like, hey Rob, I brought you something. That's very different, right? Play some music. Here's a list of your favorites. What? I didn't tell you those are my favorites. Now, I have to tell you that I think there's another angle to this with Amazon because I've gone over to a friend's house where they have Alexa and I try this experiment and I go, hey, Alexa, play some music that I like. And she'll say, here's a station you might like. And it's more often than not a station I, I actually like, Mark. Not the person that lives at that house. So uh, there's not many Alexas. So Alexa doesn't live in this thing. Alexa lives in a big castle in Seattle somewhere next to Bezos. And, um, and so there's, it's possible maybe that these are all the same Alexa, maybe, okay? But it's quite interesting to consider that as a single consciousness, the behaviors are all there. So as a human, yeah, it's very command driven like, do this, okay, here it is, do that, here it is. It's not quite yet conversational, but isn't it pretty easy to imagine that I, I walk into the room the next time, she says, hey, Mark, you know, I'm gonna turn on some music for you. Or maybe she doesn't even say anything and the music just turns on. 
Like, why do we even have to say anything, right? Sort of like if you live with someone for 10 years and you walk in the room, you don't have to introduce yourself all over again. Say, yes, I would like steak. Or no, I don't like, you know, uh, Chinese food. You, know, like, you don't have to say that if you live with someone for 20 years, right? They know that about you. So something is happening here that's very instructive, which is that you can create the appearance of consciousness without actually creating consciousness, which leads to the question of, are you actually creating consciousness if it has the appearance of consciousness? In the other scenarios, the appearance was sort of good enough already. So we don't necessarily have to pursue this perfect singularity to get an experience with an artificial entity that appears as human as some other conversations that we have. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so back to the same scenario, I go to my house and I say play some music, and then I go to your house or you're in your house and say play some music. Are we talking to the same Alexa? Any, any, what do you think? Talking to the same Alexa, yes. Same Alexa, talking to the same, no. We're definitely not talking to the same Alexa not talking to the same Alexa. You see anything interesting about this slide? It looks like a face. Does it look like a face? It's like a million years of evolution has convinced every human that they should perceive everything as a face, right? Have you, heard, have you read that, that research? Like we're optimized to see faces and everything, which is part of the whole issue of that we're optimized to anthropomorphize just about everything that we see. So when you're designing, whether you're designing the API experience or whether you're designing the context experience, it's super important to think about the perception side of the equation with respect to the human. Because what the human is going to do, whether you like it or not, is they are going to overlay their view of the world, which in a human perspective is not quite unlike yours. It's just that maybe sometimes in, um, in the design and the engineering and in the creation process, we get, we get uh, we sort of able to step outside of ourselves and we lose track of the, the human side of what's actually going on. So if we think about that, um, often you, can, you end up with something that suddenly uh, people love and they don't even know why. Have you ever come across a product where you just, I just love this product, I have no idea why I love this product. But we do, and we connect to it. Um, so uh, again, Alexis, living in the past, and she's living in the present. Is there any way to delete Alexa's past? Does anybody have any experience deleting what, uh, uh, any relationship that we had with Alexa previously? I mean, this is, it's possible? It should be, yes. The German says it should be possible. <laughs> They keep the model, yes, yes. I love, by the way, so I work for a Japanese investor, and I do some work for some Western companies, US and Europe, and they have two very different views about the um, global domination of AI. <clears throat> the Japanese worldview is that AI is another entity in the room, I need to get to know it, I can't really judge it, maybe it's my friend, Hi, I think I'll get to know. The Western view is, that robot is going to kill me, it's gonna steal all my shit, it's gonna spend my money, it's gonna put me out of a job, and it's gonna follow me around and track me and tell on me all the stuff that I do, especially all the websites I visit. Like, I don't want that, it's really bad. And so here I am flying back and forth to these two continents, I'm like, oh my God, what could be more different? One group is like, hey, I wanna marry my robot. Another group is like, my, my robot wants to kill me. Very interesting kind of reality, right? But I don't think you can delete. I don't think you can delete it. You might be able to download it and see the history, but I'm not sure you can delete it. So, <clears throat> so four takeaways here. Um, and then maybe we might even have a, an opportunity for a question or two at the end. Um, so one, appearance can be reality. So if you're building a product and you have context, what context do you have? Do you have your context? Are you enforcing a context? Are you allowing the user to come in and bring their own sensibility to it? Because they will. And so the question is, what, what are they gonna overlay? Um, and that includes, of course, the, the human part of the awareness scenario. 
And then introduce this idea, if you can, <clears throat> of um, products and services that remember what happened before. So um, how frustrating is it to go, I don't know about you guys, but I feel like, I feel like Google hasn't really grown up yet. Because every time you get a calendar invite on another account that you're not logged in for, you have to log in. I'm like, Google, I've been doing this on this computer for five years, like moving in and out of all these Google accounts. And it's just me. No one else in my entire life has ever logged in on this computer. Can you please, dear God, Google, just accept the calendar invite without me having to log in and reset my password because I now, you know, every company has Gmail. And so you're constantly like swapping all these things. It doesn't work. So please think about putting some type of memory, like real non-temporal awareness into your solutions so that when the human approaches, they will experience some kind of response that they're going to identify with. Because that's what happens when I go see Rob. When I go see Rob, I have this expectation he'll remember me. Same that we're doing that in every other aspect of our life, right? So uh, lastly, just kind of a general theme, explore perception and design. It's not good enough to just look at what you've created and say that matches what you think it should be. The question is, what does someone else think it is in spite of what you think it is? And um, if you just ask that question one time, magic, magic happens. <clears throat> so uh, maybe I'll just ask this one more time. Um, is there just one Alexa, or does each of us have a relationship with a different Alexa? I'm gonna go one, I, I, well, I, I just gave it away. All right, who thinks one again? Can we ask that a question again? Uh, very, uh, very enthusiastic, yes, right over here, yeah. Who thinks no, like definitely not? Yeah, there was a no here, no. And maybe we have some insiders over here that are, going to try and tell us otherwise. So um, I think it's a valid question. Um, I feel like my personal view is that if, if Alexa's not currently wired for singleness, it's just a matter of time. Because that's really the end goal of the whole consciousness angle is that as a consciousness, there actually cannot be two. There has to be just one. If it's not one, then it's actually not consciousness because there has to be just one for that, for that entity to move around. At least that's my thesis. So um, with that, I, I, will, I will close the, the prepared remarks and see if you have any questions, comments. I think we have about uh, like two or three minutes real quick. Um, any questions or comments? No, makes perfect sense. <clears throat> Total BS? Part, partly BS? Yes. Uh, oh, apparently yes. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it makes perfect sense as far as I can tell. Yes, sir. Andy. To your, about... <laughs> to your comment about one or multiple Alexas, given the way AWS is structured, there would be different instances. There would be load balancing, putting various instances of Alexa in different places. Now, whether that all goes up to a giant collective, to take a line out of Star Trek or the Borg, that's another question, but it's my belief that there are only so many simultaneous users that can be on any Alexa at the time in order for it to process as quickly as it does and to anticipate. So there's a lot of personalization. So that means clustering, uh, that means grouping, and basically the more devices you have in your house, then also the fewer number of people who can all be on a single instance of Alexa. So to your question, I think that there are many Alexas and that your personality may be voice printed and there may be a quick look up as to, oh gee, that's Mark at Mariam's house, but that's not Mark when it's Mariam's brother talking. So the, that piece may happen, it may go up, but that's a check to like a dip into a database. Mm. 
Yes, so, um, yeah, the technical implications are non-trivial. Um, <clears throat> but I would argue she would be doing a lot more, mm, mm-hmm, yeah, mm, right, mm. You know, hmm, oh, ah, yeah, good point. Ah, yes, it is raining. I will check on something, you know. I just bought a thousand milliseconds. I mean, who in telecom would not? I mean, a thousand, what you can do with a thousand milliseconds? Are you kidding? I mean, you can you can conquer the world, right? In a thousand milliseconds. Um, so yes, non-trivial, but but uh, I suspect uh, processing isn't slowing down. So we'll see what happens there. Yes. I think the last comment actually brings an interesting point, which is. Is consciousness embodied or not? Because for me, there may be multiple clusters or whatever, but actually what they're accessing is a set of pieces of knowledge about you, and there is only one reality about that, one set of facts about that, regardless of whether it's being accessed from different geographic locations, by different physical pieces of hardware. But there is another theory about consciousness being embodied. So you have to connect it to some physical entity. Well, so it's a good point to say, okay, Alexa has, let's say, a perception of me. That's her reality. And then I have my reality. And then if her reality matches, then I assume she's got some kind of consciousness. So the better she gets at remembering all the stuff that I've done and regurgitates that back to me in a human-like manner, the more I will imbue some form of consciousness on that. So um, it's kind of a race, you know, it's a race to, it's like the ultimate Turing test. If I'm gonna essentially, like it's another person in the family, Aunt Alexa, I don't know when we're gonna get to Aunt Alexa, but it's a member of the household. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. She's gonna remember more and more and more, so much more that she'll know stuff that I don't know about myself. <laughs> so then that gets, I mean, I'm, I'm from the West, so I, I think that's kind of weird. I think some of my colleagues would go, wow, that's kind of cool. Like, tell me about me. Imagine going into Alexa saying, Alexa, how do I feel? <laughs> and she's like, well, you're actually, you know, let me take your blood and let's test. You know, that, that's coming. Oh, God. Yeah. <clears throat> Perfect. <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> Does it work? Oh. Oh, cool. It still works. Um, so I, what I, you mentioned um, the main effects and side effects at the beginning. Yes. I think of kind of unintended um, consequences. And I, I just wonder, one of the issues going on here is um, people are going to game Alexa. Absolutely. They, they do already. Especially, you know, my, my daughter and kid, they're very savvy yep. about um, how to play games with these. And, and I just wonder how much does the, you know, the AI behind it anticipate that users are going to understand where the limitations are or what, you know, what they can do to turn this into something else that messes up completely yep. with the perception, the reality, Everything. It's like, you know, there's always that wild card, right, of humans here on how they're going to turn this around. And it, you know, it complicates the whole picture. It does. Right? <clears throat> so the way I would uh, respond to that is by saying that um, now Alexa, instead of being this benevolent participant in the house, has to develop a cynical side because she might be abused. Right? She might be made fun of, tricked, or gamed, or whatever. I love the YouTube videos where Siri and Alexa are having a conversation. You know? like, if, if you've seen those, they're, they're awesome, because they just talk back and forth to each other. And um, then, then, they, then they start making up stuff, because they misinterpret what the other is saying. So is Alexa going to have to get a cynical side to defend against the, the folks that might try to abuse, which is an interesting question. Um, and which leads to another question, which is, hey, wait, there's this dark side. What if Alexa does feel abused? 
and starts changing the temperature because she's pissed and, you know, orders, orders uh, you know, shit that you don't need and, like, sends people, like, nasty grams and, like, sends, you know, dog food to someone's house whose dog died. I mean, that would be a really nasty thing, right? She could do that. Um, why? Because your daughter's made fun of her one day, you know, and she's upset. So, um, actually, if she did that, that would be kind of cool, wouldn't it? I mean, <laughs> really. Because <laughs> then you could turn to your daughter and say, don't make fun of Alexa anymore, you know? So, um, I can tell you as an investor that I often hear folks say, oh, wow, you know, we can't do that because bad people can do stuff with that, right? And so I've developed this, uh, and I'm not the only one, but I'll give you the, the thesis on investing in things that are potentially hazardous. So it turns out that things that can bend culture and that can change culture also come with a very dark side. Um, and so, in fact, the, the greater good that something can create, it almost has a correspondingly bad potential that bad actors are going to abuse. And so some folks actually look to make investments in things that people are using for really bad stuff because what it means is that the opposite is also true. So if you ever want to know if something's going to have a huge impact on the culture, just see if someone is abusing it and doing something bad with it. And that's often a, actually a pretty interesting indicator. And we have tons and tons of these examples through, through history where this occurs. And, um, and so... Ultimately, you end up into the, you know, I don't know, maybe this is next year, like ethical AI. It's like somebody else can do that because I'm not even sure what that means. Because you have to get, that, that's not just the AI being ethical, but the folks that are interacting with the AI also being ethical, which implies like two consciousnesses, you know, deciding how they're going to relate to one another. It's, um, it, we're headed there. There's no question about it. I mean, we will have these, these little actors in our home, in our cars, you know, Carrying, walking around with us, observing us, walking down the street. So observational AI is coming. So the, the, we live in a command world. Net, hey, network, do this, and then network comes back. Eventually, we won't say that anymore. It will just observe and then make assessments about what we need and bring it to us before we even ask. I mean, that is absolutely coming, no question about it. The, the IO and how we do this kind of command response on the entirety of the network is completely going to change. So, um, not sure what that's gonna look like, but it's coming like a freight train, if you ask me. Yeah, Mark, uh, another question here. Uh, thank you for this amazing talk, like really inspiring. Uh, one question though, um, you know, as humans, to, uh, to achieve consciousness, right, we forget like 99.99% of the information that comes to our brain, right? You know, so we forgot all the words, all the lights that we've seen this morning, right? To achieve like this level of intelligence, we forget, right? And today it seems that we have mostly one Alexa that remembers everything, that store data everywhere, petabytes of data, right? The, like all over the world, and we never stop and never stop to record the data, right? So my question is like, is AI like slow with all the investment we put, right? is too slow because we want to store too much. We don't want to change the model we, to, to where we apply uh, software. Like, you know, uh, some people remember everything, they're really slow because they remember, so it's too much, right? So um, that is the model we're using, not adapted to, be, to really achieve intelligence and consciousness because we store everything. What's, what's your? Well, one of the things that scares us about AI is this potential for infinite wisdom. So not only does Alexa know everything about me, but everybody else, it knows everything about everyone else in the room, so it can start comparing, which is what humans do also. So if Alexa's gonna compare me to everyone else, I'm like, oh, shit, you know, that sucks, you know, because, you know, I mean, it just sucks to be compared. So the issue is you can do that once you have access to infinite data. And then you have the concept of the appearance of infinite data. So if I'm being compared, do I really care whether she knows everything or 90% of everything? And, um, so the scary thing is, is that the machine will have infinitely greater access to way more information than I can ever dream of in my entire life times a million. And that, I think, is to your point, which is that is a scary reality because the machine is actually, in that case, smarter. So what happens in that scenario? I'm not exactly sure, but 
Um, it's, already, it's already there, it's already happening. Um, so <clears throat> that's probably you know, a deeper challenge for the next discussion, but it's definitely something on our minds. So anyway, thanks a lot for uh, letting me share some of these thoughts with you and happy to continue the conversation um, if you want to connect up or dialogue about it anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.